Hello, everyone, and welcome to Stores Nation, coming out of, you guessed it, Stores Connecticut, home of the Yukon Huskies. This show combines all our favorite sports segments around the country with a little twist. I'm Hannah Olson. Alongside me, we have Will Richardson and Michael Sivo. So let's start off with a quick update on what's going around Yukon. Let's, what, what's going on in women's basketball, Will? Well, senior night was on Saturday. They faced Rutgers at Gamble Pavilion, and Stephanie Dolson and Bria Hartley played the final home games of their career, and they were also inducted to the Huskies of Honor. Very huge honor. A lot of the famous, excuse me, a lot of the famous players are in the Huskies of Honor. You know, Diana Taurasi, Maya Moore, my, uh, Tina Charles. A lot of the players are in there, so it's great to see them be in there. Dolson had six points, ten rebounds, and Hartley had twenty points, four rebounds, and four assists. Game where they won by a final score of seventy-two to thirty-five. And last night, the UConn women's team beat Louisville by a final score of sixty-eight to forty-eight. It was a, they shot awful from the field. They were twenty-five from sixty-five, but they were out rebounding Louisville 47 to 30 including 19 to 6 on the offensive boards Stewie she had Brianna Stewart she had 22 points 14 rebounds four blocks and two steals she looked very phenomenal and UConn's won 37 straight games in a row and now they're heading into the AAC tournament with the number one seed so Mike what's going on with men's basketball well the men's team had two uh, big wins last week particularly against Cincinnati but the first one they played was a tough road win at, U at USF the men really did not play well at all the shooting percentages were really down they couldn't hit a three to save their life it just wasn't pretty but they pulled out the win <laughs> the ever um, the, uh, the ever perfect Shabazz Napier scored 17 <laughs> points had seven assists and five rebounds another star game from him it was another game but it was a successful one another, another tough road when USF has been a hard team to beat on the road this year so even something like SMU they've gone there and lost so it was a nice win for UConn and of course the more important win this past weekend on Saturday at the Excel Center in Hartford a huge home win against for UConn against Cincinnati who at the time was the number one seed and the best team in the AAC conference up until that game. Another poor shooting effort from the Huskies, but they managed to pull it out with another strong game from Shabazz Napier. However, UConn only shot 31.3% from the field, while Cincinnati shot 27%, and that just about made the difference. Also, what happened to be popular in social media that day was a huge issue between the ref, uh, one of the refs, Ted Valentine, and of course Cincinnati's very tiny head coach, <laughs> Mick Cronin. There was a in the second half towards the end of the game, there was a big spiel between the two about an out-of-bounds call that Valentine called off Cincinnati, giving UConn another possession. And Corning and Tav Valentine got right into each other's faces and started screaming at each other. A very heated match indeed. With more on the in-game highlights, here's Eddie Leonard. The UConn men's basketball team took down conference rival number 11 Cincinnati in the sold-out XL Center in Hartford. The game was dominated by defense. It was just an ugly offensive performance by both teams. 51 was the fewest points Connecticut has scored in a win in 12 years. 12 years! Cincinnati shot a horrific 27% from the field, partly due to UConn's defense swarming Sean Kilpatrick on every play. Kilpatrick looked like Shabazz Napier out there because he had to force up shots that he did not want because he knew no one else on the team was going to take them. Kilpatrick erupted for 28 in Cincinnati's last meeting with Connecticut, but he was held to 16 on 4 of 16 shooting on Saturday. However, UConn struggled from the field as well as they only shot 31% for the game, a mere 4% more than Cincinnati's 27%. Despite all the offensive struggles, Shabazz Napier still got his buckets and led UConn to a big win over a top 15 team. Shabazz Napier led the Huskies with 18 points and 11 rebounds. Yes, I said 11 rebounds for the 5'11 point guard. Napier was able to grab 10 more rebounds than UConn's 7-foot starting center, Amita Brima. But... Rebounding is the rebounding problems are old news for Connecticut. UConn will need Brima, Nolan, and Tyler Olander to actually rebound against Louisville on Saturday if Connecticut wants another statement win before the tournament. Montreal Harrell is playing a man's game, averaging 8.2 rebounds for the Cardinals. Nolan, Brima, and Olander average 8.2 rebounds combined. If you don't see the problem, then turn off your TV. The tip-off for the UConn-Louisville game is at 2 p.m. at the KFC Yum Center. Well, that's all I got here. For everything UConn basketball, I'm Eddie Leonard, UCTV. And welcome back. So now it's 30 seconds to convince where Mike and Will are going to argue some interesting topics going on in the sports world right now. Since Mike won last time, Will gets to start. Well, I or, won last time. Or Will? Uh -oh. Yeah, get that right, because I I'll won. I worked I'll hard to get that win. I'll take so, it. So, Mike, you go I'll, first. Take the honors. Okay, okay. Well, I'll, okay, I'll let me introduce Will. the topic. Him. Um, are athletes too greedy? So, you know, we got 
Jarius Bird denying an offer from the Bills to be one of the highest paid safeties in the NFL. But then we got someone like Jacoby Ellsbury taking more money to play for the enemy in New York. Are athletes too greedy right now, Mike? Okay, so I'm a Red Sox fan, as we've made perfectly clear on the show before, so I'm very biased against Jacoby Ellsbury. But it, it doesn't just happen in baseball. Athletes are extremely greedy. Here, here are some numbers of the yearly revenues for, for the major American sports. NFL, $9 billion. MLB, $7 billion. NBA, $3.8 billion. NHL, $2.9 billion. Billions of dollars going into these revenues from sports. And these players are getting huge, huge, huge chunks of, the, of that in their salaries. They are extremely greedy, and they keep pushing that money up each year. Each player wants more every time. And they are just way, way too demanding in their contracts. They're wicked greedy. All right, what do you got to say, Will? Oh, you, wow, I'm surprised Ooh. you didn't use all of your 30 seconds. Well, I'm going to say that the athletes aren't greedy simply because of the fact that when you look at these professional athletes, they're going and they're putting their bodies on the line every single night, and especially in the sport like baseball where you're talking about a 162-game season, and they're playing three, four, five, six games a week. Football, the highest contact sport besides hockey, football, they're going, and people are getting concussions left and right. There's no protection once they leave the sport. So I think now you have to, if you're an athlete and you're putting your body on the line for somebody that may or may not have played the sport, I think they're getting exactly what they deserve. Uh, I'm going to go with Mike. They're oh, too greedy. I thought Will had, <laughs> Will had a really good argument. No, there. I think I, 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 I am it. with you. I think right. they're way too greedy these days. Oh. Play because oh. you love the game. Whatever, whatever. All right. All love here. So in college <laughs> basketball, I feel like coaches have just been really feisty this season. You know, we got... Bayheim ejected, Calpari ejected, Ali ejected. And then you got Cronin who gets in the ref's face but doesn't get a technical, doesn't like are refs getting out technicals too easy? Before we start, I just want to say watching Bayham get thrown out was the highlight of the year for me personally. <laughs> but we'll continue with the segment. Do you think they're want... giving out too easily? Oh. Uh, well, well, personally I say yes, simply because of the fact that in basketball, the point of the game is to play the game. The coach's job is to manage the game. If the people that are paid to manage the game not have the ability to manage the game, it kind of affects the way the game is played. If you look at the Syracuse-Duke game, you know, Beheim's ejection was huge because you're talking about 10 seconds left. You're down by, what was it, four or two? I believe it was four. And, you know, they made the basket to cut it to two. If you foul the player, misses a one and one, you get the ball back, you call a timeout, and you can make the play. Ali's case, you know, you're looking at when he got ejected, it matters. So the coaches need to just coach the game and the refs need to let him play. Well, well, I'm sorry you feel that way because I think you're completely wrong. I think it just, it's not happening that way. That's not the way I see it. Looking at the referee stats, they keep stacking of every tech that they pass out all through the entire season. And we're basically at the end, so we have the total numbers now. The high, the the ref has given out the most techs to Doug Sermons, 43 techs in 79 games. That's about a tech every other game. That's a huge number, but below him, it drops off to almost in half. Referees are not handing out techs at all, let alone there being too much. Ted Valentine, who had that controversy with Mick Cronin, has 17 techs in 77 games. That's about every one to six or seven games. It's not happening as much as it seems, and I just don't think, I don't think it has a place right now. I think you're wrong. I'm sorry. Well, we can agree to disagree. Obviously, the refs are going to be subjective based upon what they think is the right call, but your opinion is your opinion. My opinion is my why, opinion. Why, mm -hmm. why are you talking? I'm, you're, you had your 30 seconds, Will. He had five seconds <laughs> left so, on the clock. And for I that, you it. are DQ'd and Mike wins by default. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Fire, baby. She's just jealous of the sweater. All right. Here we go for the American Athletic Conference, our favorite conference. Um, right now, there's a lot of debate on who's the player of the year. We got Shabazz, our very own player from UConn, Kilpatrick from Cincinnati, and Russ Smith from Louisville. They're all neck and neck right now. What do we think? Who, who's, who's player of the year? Who's going to get it, Mike? Well, I'm taking Baz. I mean, I know it's easy to say because, you know, we are here in stores nation, of course. <laughs> but, I mean, you have to look at what he's done, his whole body of work. Averaging 17 points a game, six rebounds to lead the team, and six assists a game. There are very, very few players who can brag about those stats all across the league. And he wins. He gets in the honor roll for the conference almost every week consecutively. He hits game winners. He takes over for the team that need him to be there the most. He is a winner, and he has proven it. All right, Will. All right, I'm going to go with Kilpatrick from Cincinnati. I think Shabazz is a phenomenal player. He's a great player, and what he means to this UConn team is phenomenal. But when you look at Kilpatrick, and when you look at the team's record, and the GOAT up top in the AAC conference... It's already tough to do. 
But to manage that consistency all year, and we see the struggles when Shabazz isn't in the lineup. But with Cincinnati, they've been very fluid, and Kilpatrick leads the team in every area. He doesn't have to be the player like with Shabazz where he has to carry the team. The movement moves through Kilpatrick, and I think he's the player of the year for me. Well, in honor of senior night tomorrow for UConn, got to go with Bass, so Mike gets the sweep. <laughs> oh, All that's right. great. That's great. Oh, that's beautiful. We haven't had a sweep this season, so here we oh, go. Oh, man, just <laughs> under the bus. <laughs> we'll slip under the bus. All right. righty. Another great argument. However, we're going to toss it to the commercial really quickly, but when we come back, Will and I will be in the lounge for Are You Kidding Me? And welcome back. Now it's time for Are You Kidding Me? Myself and Mike, we're in this beautiful lounge, and we're going <laughs> to talk about the things that kind of ticked us off a little bit this week. So what got me upset this week was the NBA with LeBron James's mask. First of all, LeBron, I applaud you for wearing the mask because the mask has become a trademark with these players and these facial injuries. So I applaud you for, first of all, wearing the mask. And then for the NBA to step in and say, we like you wearing a mask. We want you to protect yourself because you make us a lot of money, but we feel that it's an unfair advantage because the opponents can't see your eyes. They can't see his eyes. Are you kidding me? Like, how can you not see his eyes? He clearly has eye holes in the mask. It's not like he's, you know, wearing a blind face mask. Like, ah! But commandments to LeBron, 61 points, huge game, and shows that no mask can make a difference about how much, how well you play. Mike, what got you this week? Well, I agree with you on the, on the LeBron thing, definitely. That really ticked me off, too. Like, are you kidding me? Seriously? <laughs> but you know what really surprised me this week? All these top 25 teams in college basketball going down. Like, are you kidding me? Kentucky at South Carolina? What? Are you serious? <laughs> no. Unacceptable, John Calipari. Show me something here, okay? They are 11 and 19. They have been relevant since... Maybe before I was born. I don't even know. See, that's how bad that loss was. I don't know. The last time they've been relevant, and I'm here to tell Kentucky, are you kidding me? St. Louis, are you kidding me? You've lost two games in a row against OK Atlantic 10 teams? Are you serious? Like, Kansas, Kansas, you want to be a, you want to be a one seed? You can't lose Oklahoma State, who, despite winning anything with uh, Marcus Smart back, mm -hmm. they still have, they don't have enough to get into the tournament, and you're going to lose that game. You need a statement win. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I don't know, Mike. That, that seems to be a lot. You know, this is upset season that we're coming upon. You know, the upset's pretty popular now in college basketball. But we're going to take a quick commercial. All right. Well, welcome back. So now we're part of one of the funnest parts of the show. Tell me how you really feel, where I'm going to just name a couple <laughs> of things that happened this week. Um, and Will and Mike are going to do a little artwork or a little phrase or something on the whiteboard. Show off their creative juices, not on my face. Um, <laughs> last night, LeBron went off, for lack of a better word, and it was he got 61 points, obviously a career high. It's just absurd. And, you know, it was over the Bobcats, but they had a fifth-ranked defense. So it was a substantial, and he's still wearing the mask. Still wearing the mask. Still wearing the mask. 61 points. It was, it was phenomenal. I, I, I don't know about this MVP race, but they're sure making it interesting. All right, Mike. Well, all I got to say to you, LeBron, is splash. Yo, dude, you were so wet last night. Six for eight from three, that was just magical. Now, I understand that people like to hate on LeBron because they say, oh, you know, he's annoyed with the whole decision thing and everything, but he's still one of the best players, and you've got to stop hating on him. People are all mad that he has, oh, who cares if LeBron has such a great game, 61 points. Kobe had more. Yeah, so 61 points isn't still a good game. LeBron was wet. You have to appreciate it. Well, for me... Hashtag team on his back. Hashtag Swiss Army Knife. <laughs> He's a Swiss Army Knife because last night he did it all. Not only did he have 61 points, but he also had a couple assists and rebounded the ball well. Carmelo, he had 62 early in the year, didn't have a single assist. LeBron, he did everything that the team needed him to do. And they still won the game by 17. You know, if you're looking at the game with Melo, they won that game by 20. But other... Then, you know, J.R. Smith, that gave him a couple of points. They didn't really have anybody. You know, Miami got solid production, and especially with Wade being out, they got production from Bosch, from Allen, from Birdman, from everybody that played in that game, which is really important because if they want to get that one seed, they need LeBron and everybody on that team to produce. So, LeBron, congratulations. You put the team on your back, and keep doing your thing. 
Alrighty, well this past weekend, the UConn women's basketball team elected Dawson, Stephanie Dawson and Bria Hartley into the Huskies of Honor. Talked about that a little bit earlier today, and now we're just going to expand on it and have our own opinions on it. Dawson, of course, has an amazing statistic. She shoots 59%, that's her career percentage, with um, 1,684 points. Bria Hartley shooting 45% and 1,861 points, so if they make a decent run in the tournament, Bria Hartley could be seeing herself over 2,000 points. But, uh, all right, Mike, what do you got? I guess I'll start. Just going to give a nice little golf clap to our ladies with some <laughs> hearts because I just love them so much. I'm going to miss them so much. And while I worked at the game on the other day, I admit I got a little bit choked up because those girls have meant so much to this program. And I really enjoy watching them grow and develop with Gino. You know, he takes care of his girls a lot, but there are always a few players on his team that stand out to him the most and that he appreciates the most. Kelly Ferris is a great example from last year's team. He knows how much those girls have meant to this program. They brought him a championship last year. They have a great shot of one this year. Such terrific all-around basketball players. I'm going to miss them a lot. Couldn't agree more. What do you got, Will? Well, I've got 133 and 11 <laughs> and Spirit of UConn. When you look at Stephanie Dolson and what Bria Hartley do for the team, they are essentially the definition of what it means to be a basketball player at UConn. You know, you have Maya Moore and Tina Charles, and they were also the spirit of their team, or their respective teams. But Dolson, she's that energetic player. She's the mama bird on the team, and you can tell that she cares a lot about her team. And Bria Hartley, she's a facilitator. Everything runs through her on offense. You know, she's moving the ball around, and everybody on that team loves Hartley, and they love Dolson. It's sad to see them go, but 133-11 and 11 is an amazing record for four years. They got a national championship out of it. Like Mike said, they have a good shot to win a second one this year. So, congratulations to Dolson and Hartley. You guys are going to do great things. Alrighty, in other UConn basketball news, not such good news though. Andre Drummond, there was rumors this summer that he was dating Jeanette McCurdy, and that fling didn't last very long. In fact, Jeanette says that she only dated him because she felt bad, and that he was a bad kisser. Well, Andre responded today saying it's all false, and that she was pretty much making the whole thing up. I mean... It's just kind of embarrassing for Andre, but he's got to keep that rep intact. What do you got, Will? <laughs> My favorite hashtag, hashtag bananas, hashtag ooh. <laughs> Man, this was so dirty. I understand if the relationship doesn't go well. You know, we're all human. We all make mistakes every now and then. But to do it the way that she did, she didn't do it like subtly to one of her friends or something like that. She did this in an interview for the whole rest of the world to see. And if you're Andre Drummond, you do not need the distraction going over your head. If you're on the Pistons, you're trying to make it into that top four seeds for the Eastern playoffs. You need to stay focused. And as hard as it is to balance your personal life and your professional life, you've got to get it together, Andre. Regardless of whatever, hap whatever happened, you got to just keep focused and keep doing what got you there in the first place. Mike, well, you... Wait, well, let me just ask you. If uh -oh. you were Andre Drummond, okay. would you have responded? Do you think that was the right move for him to respond, or do you think he should have just let it go? I mean, it's kind of tough to say because when you're put in that position, you're, you know, your opinion on the subject can change. Me, If I were him right now, I probably wouldn't have responded simply because of the fact that it makes it seem like it could possibly be true. You know, it, now it's like, if I'm in a relationship like that, first of all, I wouldn't want the public to know about it anyway. But because of the fact that the public knows about it, he just needed to stay quiet. But And I just find it hard to believe. She says it only lasted a week. They had so many pictures together. So unless they were taking pictures together every minute in different outfits, it doesn't make any hey, sense. Instagram is I'm calling yes, Jeanette's okay. bluff and saying, Andre, they were really together. You heard it here first. All right, Mike, what do you got? Okay, I'm going to call her soft. <laughs> Hashtag I was soft. wondering who you were aiming that to. I didn't know that's if it was her. like an Andre song. That's her. You know what? She, that's off because she's got some Andre pictures out there right now. So she better stop yapping her mouth. She's got a lot more explaining to do. So she better Ooh. turn it around. I mean, I personally, I don't like people who sell people, other people they've dated like that in the celebrity life out in the tabloids. I mean, she, she didn't have to speak a word about that. Yeah, people want to know about it. it. That's what entertainment's all about. Nobody had to know. She goes and tries to embarrass <laughs> him out in the public while he's putting in work on the boards in the NBA right now. And he, did the, he did the mature thing a lot of 20-year-olds wouldn't do and just deflected it and said, that's not true, that's not how it worked. I don't need a mature adult about it. She's got to get her stuff together because I don't like what she's been up to lately. Yeah, man, Nickelodeon, man. Uh, well, just that, I call it you. Right across right. Where you at, girl? What's good? <laughs> oh, my God. All right, well, lastly, o is Oklahoma State a contender now? After losing seven in a row, 
The Cowboys have now won four games since Marcus Smart came back from his three-game suspension. Some of these wins include Kansas, which is a great win, and Kansas State, another good win. But I think them beating Kansas has really put them back on the bubble. So they're still seventh in the Big 12, which is terrible. But do they have any hope? What do we got here, Will? <sighs> nah, chill. <laughs> chill with that. Honestly, a couple of big wins, yes, they do matter, but they'll, they will make the tournament, no doubt. They'll make okay. the tournament because a lot of teams that have better records than OK State don't have the big wins that OK State just got. So I think they'll make the tournament, but they're not a contender. They're not even contending their own conference. They were ranked and because they were ranked because of the strength of Marcus Smart and Markel Brown. Everybody else on that team disappeared for the most part. So if you're going to be ranked on the base of one or two players, you have to have the whole package. You need to have a record like Florida be 27-2. and two. But because they don't, and the only two major wins they have are Kansas State and Kansas, I'm not buying it. Everybody needs to chill with that. All right, Mike. All right, well, to contradict everything Walt just said, I believe, and I can fly for those patient fans. He can't fly. His jacket's too tight, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, my wings are clipped, man. But <laughs> in all seriousness, I like what Marcus Murray has been doing since he's come back. He's terrorizing opponents he played. They haven't played the best teams in the league. But you took down Kansas at home. That's a nice one, whether or not Kansas is undeserving of that one seed or not. They're a good team. They have NBA prospects just like the Oklahoma State Cowboys do. It's a great win. Why not give them some credit? They've been winning a lot more since come back. Smart's putting up ridiculous numbers. Who's to say a team led by one really, really talented player can't do it? What did you kind of do with Kim a few years ago? Yeah, I mean, he, he had Hey, he don't had hate on Jeremy Lamb. Oh, no, I'm, I was just <laughs> going to say, he had his partners too. Lots of good players on that team. Very plays a lot of ability, but so does Marco Brown and a lot of those other guys. Yep. Other guys in Oklahoma State, they have ability too, and they can go a long way if they stay gelled and let Marcus Smart lead them to victory. Well, we can agree to disagree. Mike's very educated on his opinion, and I'm educated on mine, but when we come back, we're going to have the bold predictions from everybody here at Stores Nation. And welcome back. I, Will and I are here on this beautiful background Miami Beach set here to bring you some of our bold predictions for this week. So I'll get started off. I'm going to call, maybe I think my boldest one yet so far this uh -oh. year, Virginia men's basketball in the final four. Oh, you're going to have to explain this one, Mike. Oh, I'm about to. Here's the deal. Listen, Break it down. They have some very, very strong wins recently. They've won double-digit games in a row in the ACC conference. That's an impressive feat. Not many teams can claim that. Maybe UNC's out right out there with them, but Virginia's just wrecking everybody. That defense is just almost unstoppable. You cannot break through what they're doing in the paint right now. They just beat Syracuse. They made Syracuse look bad in that second half. They almost beat Duke earlier in the season at Duke. They gave that game away and they lost by four. But if they did, they'd probably be in the top three right now. That's how good they've been. I don't see why they can't be that Final Four team. Maybe even take it all, but I'll say just Final Four for now. Wow, that's, I don't know how I'm going to top that. Well, I'm going to stick to UConn Louisville. I'm going to say that Ryan Boatwright's going to outscore Russ Smith by 10 points and that UConn's going to win. Oh, when wow. you simp when at you look Louisville? At, at Louisville? At Louisville. Hey, we saw the women do it. Why can't the men? Here's my argument about this. When Boatwright and Shabazz are both operating as well as they can, we saw it in the game against Memphis. They didn't shoot well from the field, but they killed it from the free throw line. So I think if Boatwright can attack the basket, if he can drive and he can do the things that we expect Boatwright to do day in and day out, then I think it's going to be a very tough matchup for Louisville, regardless of them being the national champions and all. And Russ Smith, I feel like as great of a player as he is, sometimes he's very inconsistent at times. He'll score 20 points one game and then score four the next game. You know, he'll completely fall off the radar, and then they'll push it to all the other players on the team to step up their game as well. So I think that if... Boatwright can somehow find the magic for the last game of the year and find a way to essentially play UConn basketball, get his fellow teammates involved, and just do the things that they need him to do to finish the season strong going into the tournament. I think, why not? Mike, what do you think? I mean, why not? I mean, we have, well, not we, UConn has plenty of guys that can sure. do a whole bunch of scoring. I think, along with Boatwright, too, Boatwright can easily take down Russ Smith. If you put Lasan Chroma on top of Russ Smith, I think they can easily shut him down. And especially if you force him to shoot. We know how great of a guy he is when he gets inside and gets to the rim and takes free throws. But if you can get Russ Smith to calm down and force him to shoot, you can have a great shot. And if you can do that, and Borak can get inside and do his dirty work in the paint, there's no reason why you can't score at least 10 more and get a huge road win at Louisville. Well, for Mike Sivo, Hannah Olsen, I'm William Richardson, live from Stores Nation, and we'll see you guys next week.